Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon for those of you in the East Coast. Afternoon. We'll wait one more minute and we'll give it a start then. Mm -hmm. Nice to see some familiar faces uh, joining the webinar here. Excited. It's going to be an interesting talk, I think. All right, well, let's kick things off. Thank you for joining us today as we talk about penetration testing, the return on investment of penetration testing engagements. Today, you'll be joined by my esteemed colleague, Chris Graziano, and myself, Ben Boydacoon. So a quick agenda, we're gonna cover off brief introductions about Chris's background as well as my background. We're going to go through the objectives of offensive security engagements. How do we define ROI metrics for these types of engagements? Our example ROI calculations, as well as supplementary cybersecurity strategies overall, and just our thoughts and conclusions about the return on investment for pen testing activities. I guess uh, just before we, we jump into things, um, if there are any questions as we go through this, we'll try and address them as we go along. Um, but uh, please put your questions in the, the Q&A and um, one of us will get to it as we're going through the presentation. We may have to leave it for the end, depending on how the flow is, is going, but we'll try and address all the questions that come up. Thanks, Chris. So a brief history about myself. My name is Ben Boydaku. I've been in the industry, the cybersecurity industry for over 20 years. In around 2007, I started a boutique technology risk management consulting firm. And really what that was, was we did a lot of cyber risk advisory, as well as a lot of penetration testing and ethical hacking assessments, as well as in the early days, we did a lot of vulnerability assessments as well. I eventually sold my firm to another firm named Scaler. Scaler was acquired by CDW and I'm now the practice leader for risk advisory services nationally. And a bit about myself, I've been in the IT space now for, I don't know, I guess it's been about 20 or so years, uh, just over 20 years, but really started focusing in cybersecurity back in 2015. Um, I then joined uh, the Scala Decisions team along with Ben uh, back in 2017. And uh, I've now since been leading the practice uh, on the penetration testing side or the offensive security side uh, of risk advisory services uh, since 2020 um, and have quite a bit of experience in different industries, um, you know, actually doing penetration testing and red team assessments for a variety of different organizations, small and large. Um, and along the way, I've come across a bunch of different insights on how organizations should uh, be looking to maximize their cybersecurity investments. And really, that's what this talk is going to be about, is how can we maximize the return of investment on uh, offensive security assessments, um, as they are a crucial part to uh, ensuring your cybersecurity investments are adequate. And uh, I guess we'll we'll go on to we'll jump right into it um, to the next slide here. Now, before we start talking about offensive security objectives and the purpose behind doing penetration testing and red team assessments, um, let's let's start talking about some cyber security concerns that we typically see from our clients, from customers, um, and some of the drivers really that ultimately push us towards um, investing in cybersecurity uh, tools and services. And Ben, maybe you can you can touch on some of the things that we're seeing uh, most recently. All right, so recently, before we even get into the points, we're, we're seeing threats like mobile security threats, the increased likelihood of cyber crimes against businesses, social media threats, business email compromise scams, insider threats, global cyber attacks. And as an industry, we know that that's really increased a lot in the past few years. Um, the suboptimal cybersecurity practices of third parties, that's been a big one in the news as well. 
the shortage of cybersecurity staff and the limited hiring pool to get great talent. On the other side, evolving malware, regulatory and landscape compliance challenges, again, third party risks overall, and just looking at how do we define cybersecurity outcome driven metrics so we could communicate from those in the field doing the cyber the cyber security activities to those in the boardroom who need those done and how do we quantify the activities that we conduct chris yeah so some, some of the questions we we typically see um you know we've experienced a few security breaches in the past it's becoming a major concern for our stakeholders and this has to do with inadequate cyber security measures um you know next uh, keeping up with uh, the ever-changing regulations in our industry, uh, it's become a constant struggle for us, making sure we're compliant, you know, and, and these regulatory compliance challenges are a big concern for a lot of organizations as well. You know, we're unsure how to prioritize technological risks and align them with our overall business strategy. So there's, there's really a lack of clarity in the governance around technology. Um, we talk about data privacy concerns, you know, with, with recent increase in data breaches, we're really concerned about protecting our customers' data uh, and their sensitive information. Um, ben touched on this, you know, a cybersecurity talent shortage, finding and retaining the qualified cybersecurity professionals in this industry has become a significant challenge uh, for most organizations. Um, you know, another, another concern is high vulnerability exposure. Uh, we recently underwent a vulnerability assessment and we were alarmed with how many vulnerabilities were identified, especially for organizations that have never done that before. That becomes a huge concern when they start seeing hundreds of vulnerabilities that they need to tackle in order to secure their environment. Um, an unclear cybersecurity strategy, you know, a lack of a clear roadmap for cybersecurity initiatives and unsure where to start. You know, and finally, the, the rising costs of cybersecurity in general. Um, you know, cybersecurity budgets have significantly increased over the last few years, and a lot of organizations are concerned about the sustainability of that expense. And so these are all, um, you know, all things that we need to take into consideration when, you know, looking at investments for cybersecurity. And um, really trying to measure the return on investment in cybersecurity becomes a difficult challenge when you have all these, these, these issues coming at you in different areas. And so um, some of the main cybersecurity drivers um, and, the, and the reasons why organizations ultimately look to procure cybersecurity investments, you know, the biggest one, and this is what everybody um, can, can associate with cybersecurity, is it's really used as a cost savings um, um, investment to prevent breaches from occurring. And those cost savings uh, trickle down to regulatory fines from not meeting certain compliance requirements, um, litigation costs, you know, as a result of legal uh, issues that stem from a data breach, and then remediation expenses. And remediation expenses, you know, that's not just um, how much it costs, let's say, to get an external firm to do those, uh, to fix maybe some of the issues you've, you've uh, identified, but maybe doing a forensic investigation is, is a requirement in order to determine how this happened to begin with, making sure you're paying your staff uh, to uh, focus on this particular issue and not, let's say, other productive issues that you need them to be focusing on. So there's quite a bit of expenses that really tie into remediation expenses. and. Because cybersecurity is often viewed through the narrow lens of cost avoidance uh, of potential breaches, um, you know, there's a lot of other broader spectrum of benefits that often get neglected. Um, and we'll talk about those in a second, but knowing all this, it makes it very difficult to quantify the cost benefits of cybersecurity investments. And so there's a couple of broader, uh, I guess, uh, broader benefits that come with cybersecurity that um, organizations offer overlook. And it's worth articulating the genuine worth of these cybersecurity investments to your stakeholders um, because it's not just a preventative measure. It can also improve your brand recognition, your brand reputation. Um, it can build customer trust. Um, you know, how many of you in your personal lives will no longer do business with an organization because of how they handle data breaches, how they've handled, um, you know, a breach that's happened in the past. And so businesses operate the same way. You won't necessarily want to do business with an organization that doesn't take cybersecurity seriously. Um, and then, of course, compliance with regulatory standards. Making sure you're compliant, you know, means you don't have to worry about these fines that are coming down the road um, for not being compliant. Um, and so these are all additional benefits that are often overlooked. And then when we start looking at how we can determine the full uh, return of investment of these cybersecurity um, 
uh, initiatives. Go to the next slide, Ben. Uh, one way we can do this is through offensive security testing. And so offensive security testing, for those of you who aren't super familiar, it's penetration testing um, and red team assessments. And really, the this is just another tool in the arsenal of cybersecurity uh, practitioners. And these are meant to be a proactive approach to measure the effectiveness of uh, your cybersecurity program. And ideally, you're looking to do this for multiple reasons, you know, from a penetration testing perspective, um, which is more overt and is really focused on really specific areas of the network potentially or your application or whatever it is you're looking to test. Um, you're looking to identify vulnerabilities. You're looking to assess the current state of your countermeasures and your controls to protect your environment. Um, you're looking to foster a culture of security awareness within your organization. And this is done through activities such as, you know, social engineering simulations, phishing simulations, um, and, and possible red teams as well. Um, and ultimately, the, the goal of these is also to prioritize data protection, um, you know, protecting your IP or protecting your customers' data, sensitive information, whatever your organization might be looking to protect. And ultimately, staying ahead of emerging threats. These are all the reasons why you would want to consider doing penetration testing and red team red teaming assessments um, in order to validate that you have the right investments in place. Now, in order for these to be effective, uh, in order for these tools to be um, uh, seen as a return of investment, you need to be doing regular scanning, regular testing, um, a regular schedule in order for you to be able to quantify changes over time. If you're doing these as one offs and not really looking at things, you know, over a year to year perspective in some cases or sooner than that, uh, the data ends up becoming useless and you can't really measure whether or not you're getting better uh, or you're improving in your cybersecurity posture over time. Uh, additionally, you should be looking to have a very clear and defined scope when you're performing a penetration test or a red team. More often than not, you know, organizations don't really have an idea of what they need to be looking to protect, so they look at everything. And maybe that's good for some organizations, um, but you know, some organizations, our organizations are, are much larger. They don't have the capacity to check every single asset to make sure that that asset is fully compliant, it doesn't have any vulnerabilities, and it really doesn't make sense from a business objective perspective to be scanning every single machine. And so making sure that you have a clear scope and the testing is ultimately tied to very clear and defined business objectives, that ultimately uh, ensures that the results you're getting from these assessments, uh, is mean they're meaningful and that they actually have impactful results that, um, that really can drive changes into your cybersecurity program. And lastly, you know, to conduct these tests, you really do need to have uh, professional expertise, whether that's in-house or you're ensuring that you're outsourcing to a vendor that is trusted, that has a reputation of performing these assessments in a professional manner, and they know how to um, siphon down the, the business objectives ultimately of your organization and help you position your cybersecurity, um, uh, I guess the findings from these assessments uh, to help uh, bolster your cybersecurity program ultimately and really tie back to the, the business's goals. So now we're going to talk about, I guess, defining some of these, you know, return on investment metrics. Um, and I guess Ben will, will will start us off here. No problem. Thanks, Chris. So when we look at some of the goals we're trying to achieve with defining cybersecurity metrics, we can look at strategic alignment, which is the most important. Do not do, but more so executives want to ensure their cybersecurity investments are aligned with their strategic goals. So are the activities that you're proposing to conduct or the tool sets or what you're looking to bring in as a cybersecurity control, is that aligned to the overall company strategic goals? Then we look at how often do offensive security assessments contribute to the business objectives? When we think of questions like that, it's usually on the inverse because we're going to identify issues hopefully before the external threat actors identify them. So we want to make sure that we're reducing our potential costs of breach. So whether it's direct costs like financial theft, sales disruption, operations disruption, stock price drop, legal costs, investigation costs, 
work time costs, regulatory fines, PR costs. Again, when when you start understanding from a business perspective, what are the what are the cost of their losses? You're able to quantify and explain to them in their terms what's potentially at stake and why you're conducting the assessments you're conducting. So as an example over here, protecting intellectual property and maintaining customer trust. Those are both direct and indirect costs that we're looking to protect as doing these assessments. So another goal would be risk reduction. And ultimately, executives, when you're talking about cybersecurity, they're concerned about risk exposure. Um, you know, how how much risk does the organization have in its current state? Uh, what are the likelihood of an attack actually being successful and what kind of damage that can cause? And so understanding how offensive security assessments like penetration testing and red teaming, how those can help mitigate risks and explaining that to the stakeholders is, is crucial um, because that's what's going to get you the investments uh, that you need in order to ensure that you're protecting um, your organization and ultimately reducing your risk exposure. So examples of how risk reduction can be communicated um, and metrics you should be considering when, when talking to stakeholders, you should be you know, discussing how many vulnerabilities. I mean, that makes the most sense. You know, how many uh, gaps and vulnerabilities have been identified as a result of one of these assessments? What kind of attack paths were identified that could be potentially abused? You know, is there an attack path that maybe leverages a third party in that you're currently partnering with that really you don't have actual control over the infrastructure or the way it's been implemented? And you need to take that into consideration as well as part of your overall risk uh, exposure. Um, and then finally, you know, preventing prevent potential be potential breaches. You know, um, if by doing an off offensive security assessment, how are you able to react? How are you able to um, deter an attacker? What kind of friction can you uh, put in place to make it very hard for an attacker to uh, ultimately get to that end goal? And so risk reduction is a very important goal when um, when discussing with stakeholders about um, how to how to measure uh, you know the metrics around uh, cybersecurity considerations. One one goal or one point that many in the field don't necessarily look at is overall competitive advantage. How do offensive security assessments enhance the organization's competitive position? It's it's pretty simple in the sense that if you're able, going back to the risk reduction, if you're able to minimize minimize breaches or mitigate breaches because you are proactively identifying issues and mitigating them, you're building a trusted brand. You're showing the organizations that you partner with and your clients that you have a proactive security posture, and that can potentially attract clients and partners. And just to touch on that too, before we go to the next one, um, you know, there's a lot of clients who that's a proactive approach before they start partnering with either you know their vendors or their their clients or they want to do business they will ask when was the last time a penetration test was performed in your organization and they want to see proof and so we've seen time and again clients come to us in a scramble because they haven't done a pen test in the last two or three years and they ultimately have a huge contract that's coming their way and they need to demonstrate that they've done their due diligence and so you know they're scrambling to get this done um, this is causing a lot of tension. They may lose the contract. Executives are starting to get frustrated because now there's millions of dollars on the line that we're not able to capture because we haven't been proactive in our security approach. So things to consider. I'll jump on the um, next one, Chris. OK, sure. <laughs> so in terms of regulatory compliance, in almost every field, there, there's some form of standard or legislation that's onerous to us operating these organizations. So if you're in finance in Canada, you have OFSFI, which has in their cybersecurity, I'll call it framework for now, but in their framework, it has a requirement for penetration testing. PCI, if you're in retail, has that requirement. A lot of insurance companies before providing cyber insurance cybersecurity insurance or cyber insurance, they require you to conduct penetration testing as well. A lot of third party risks when you're working with larger partners require that as well. It's becoming table stakes. It's something that you do need to do. The main purpose is are you in compliance with industry standards and regulate regulations? And that's a priority. And the question is, as I mentioned, it is mandatory for a lot of fields. But how do penetration tests, offensive security assessments, red teams help us meet this compliance? So it's also a, 
it's also a business need or a business requirement that we do this for. And overall examples, besides avoiding penalties and avoids reputational damage, it enables you to start partnering with bigger organizations or stay in compliance in the industries that you want to maintain relevance in business wise. And, and the, the last one we have here is long term impact. And you know, ultimately, stakeholders and executives, they want to see how this is going to provide benefits for the organization. And if you can turn something that would be considered a cost sink, something that is just mandatory for operations into an actual benefit, you're going to get a lot more backing. You're going to get a lot more support um, in your cybersecurity investments. And so how can offensive security assessments uh, really contribute to this? Well, they can contribute to it in multiple ways, you know, um, through demonstrating resilience against you know, um, latest attacks and latest threats that are out there. But, you know, as I mentioned before, building brand reputation, building that customer trust, um, you know, ultimately these things can lead to actual proactive benefits to the organization. And so some examples we've listed here, you know, reduction in breach, breach, breach related costs, you know, ultimately does come down to um, reducing how much uh, damage can be done uh, from a financial perspective. Um, but also what kind of competitive advantage does that really give you as an organization? And so we've touched on on uh, through some of these topics already, how that can benefit the organization. So now let's talk about example um, return of investments calculations that we can leverage uh, for offensive security type of assessments. So as mentioned before, you know, quantifying vulnerabilities um, and the number of vulnerabilities is going to be one of the first ways you can help demonstrate value. Um, calculating the number of gaps, vulnerabilities in a penetration test in a red team, you know, and then measuring that over time, you can start seeing, um, you know, progressive uh, changes to your security posture. And if you can categorize them by severity, which you should be doing, you know, critical high, mediums and lows, you can then also um, take into account over time how many criticals, how many highs, you know, and it really does show proactive um, uh, adjustments to the cybersecurity program to address those vulnerabilities. And, and really the, the whole purpose around that is concrete data is what stakeholders are going to need to see. And so if you have quantifiable qu concrete data, so around vulnerabilities, you can demonstrate the impact of how these assessments are actually reducing overall risk in the organization over time. A one-time assessment is going to demonstrate what needs to be addressed doing this programmatically over time is going to show how you are improving and how this, these cybersecurity investments are actually necessary in order to reduce risk in the organization. So an example, um, you know, uh, proposal here is, you know, our last red team engagement uncovered 12 critical vulnerabilities that could have led to a major breach. You know, this has demonstrated that this was a necessary task in order to help identify these gaps that need to be mitigated. Otherwise, the potential for this to be breached in the future is much higher, especially because they're critical rated. So if these are things you can help use to communicate that value, um, especially around uh, how specific vulnerabilities, criticality wise and number of vulnerabilities um, can help get you there. And that perfectly ties into cost avoidance metrics. So in the example Chris mentioned, our last engagement, we were able to identify these critical vulnerabilities that could have led to a major breach. When you're looking at cost avoidance metrics, you're now looking at how much would that breach would how much would that breach cost the organization? Um, I'm going to rattle off a few direct and indirect costs to consider when putting together your cost avoidance metrics. So on the consumer end, there's financial theft, legal costs, stock price drop, extortion payments, credit monitoring costs. If if it was consumer data that was breached, indirect costs that we don't necessarily think of. But there's the loss of time, loss of wages, identity theft costs, loss of convenience, credit loss, loss of employment opportunities, price increases, and emotional stress. These are things that we don't always take into consideration as we're putting together that number, but we should look at what metrics are available for us to put together that number, whether it's industry surveys, whether it's using generative AI for some information, where the information is at our fingertips now to put together a number and cite how we derive that number. Very important to do. So we're estimating the financial losses prevented by addressing vulnerabilities proactively. Again, quantifiable numbers, very easy to explain to senior management and executives. 
and that leads us into potentially doing business impact scenarios to for ROI calculations. I'll let you jump on on that one, Chris. Yeah, and I think really it comes down to um, really tying everything back to the business, and uh, we talked about this before. And so, you know, cost avoidance is super important. Uh, you know, obviously, this this saves the company money. So, what kind of scenarios are going to affect the business? Uh, from a technological standpoint, from a cybersecurity standpoint. So creating realistic scenarios that illustrate the consequences of a successful attack is super important. And this goes back to clearly defining the scope and clearly tying it back to business objectives. Um, because this, if you can visualize it and you and you present it in, a such, in such a way to the stakeholder, this resonates with them. Because now they can see, oh wow, if this system went down, let's say you're a manufacturing plant and a um, a threat actor was able to get into your CNC machine or get into your CAD files, for example, and make a change to one of the CAD drawings by one inch. And you've got hundreds of thousands of steel, uh, dollars of steel that you need to be making for parts. And because of that change that they've made, uh, it's now ruined the entire line. Um, if you can demonstrate how that would be possible from a, you know, a very controlled manner, this is now going to resonate with with stakeholders because they can see that not only was this possible, but you 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 know you did it, you demonstrated it um, in a controlled way, of course, and this needs to be addressed. So, you know, one of the suggestions they have uh, we have listed here is you know imagine a customer database was compromised, we'd lose trust, we'd face legal fees, we'd suffer from reputational damage, um, and we're seeing this all the time in in all these public data breaches that um, you know we see in the news. Um, it loses customer confidence. Uh, and you know, ultimately, we as organizational leads don't want to see that happen. Um, so tying it back to the business is is a great way to communicate value um, and the return on investment of these offensive security assessments. So, so going again, looking at the positive aspects of conducting these activities, the security culture enhance, enhancements. So measuring the improvements in security awareness post assessment. A good example is a major part of our red team engagements. We have a social engineering or a phishing campaign as we're able to identify whether the company is strong at identifying those fictitious vulnerabilities or threats that or the simulated simulated attacks or whether they're not. We're looking to improve the culture overall. So not only by oh we found 50% of the people click the link and they're bad. No, we're looking at the opportunities to help improve their posture and improve their awareness overall. So having a security conscious workforce is definitely an asset because everyone says the, the human is the weakest link. It's because when you look at the easiest path of entry for a lot of organizations that we compromise, we compromise people first. So as an example, after our red team exercise, employee reported phishing incidents decrease by X number of percent. So that's when you're done the engagement, you're monitoring over time, whether you bring in an automated phishing tool for just the recurring reminder, we're able to now show that the team has gotten better in identifying phishing threats. Yeah, we'll touch on phishing in a little bit as well um, later in this presentation. Um, We'll dive a little bit deeper into some some ways we can look to uh, improve the security culture overall with the organization. Um, but the last, I guess, calculation here we can talk about that communicates value to stakeholders is you know the risk mitigation efficiency. Um, you know, comparing the actual costs of doing an assessment versus how much it's going to cost to deal with a breach. And if you can quantify that, um, you know that really does resonate with with stakeholders ultimately. And that's you know. Um, really identifying a way to efficiently address you know, vulnerabilities um, and gaps in the environment uh, while you know, at the same time minimizing um, your overall risk exposure. And so an example of that is you know, our annual red team budget is $50,000 while a single breach could cost us millions. And of course, this is for you know, maybe a larger organization, but uh, even for smaller organizations, you know, understanding the, the cost and benefit behind proactively doing these types of assessments versus how much it's going to cost for a breach, it's important to start putting those numbers on paper and that can be demonstrated to communicate value to stakeholders. And this this works with the cost avoidance 
calculation as well. Because if we've started to define how much a breach would cost, whether a worst case scenario or a, a minor breach, when we start looking at all the costs that are associated with dealing with the breach, we're able to leverage how much would this engagement cost us to do to potentially identify something that would lead to those type of losses. So walking through an example penetration testing ROI business case. So something we've helped clients build in the past to have larger engagements done within the organization, but it works with smaller engagements as well, depending on budget, budget requests and budget asks, et cetera. So the overall is always just the executive summary. What are we doing? Why are we doing it? How is it gonna how's it gonna evaluate our incident response capabilities as well as how is it gonna mitigate risks? Um, I believe we're gonna share this presentation afterwards, or there's gonna be the opportunity to share them. So you can use this for your own uses as well. So a brief background going back to what Chris mentioned overall, really defining the scope. What are what are we doing? And then besides the what are we doing, why are we doing it overall and providing that kind of information around that. Then we, then we get into the overall what we're proposing to do. So whether it's a penetration test or a red team engagement, again, the scope, what's the methodology overall? Again, very simple terms, business related terms, and then what are, what are the benefits overall? So if it's risk reduction, if it's compliance, is it threat simulation, is it re incident response testing? but having having the ROI considerations put into place as well at that early stage just to, to warm the reader up to the calculations that we would present. Yeah, and a good opportunity to throw in here is, you know, statistics you might even be able to see publicly, right? From, from other breaches that may be out there, other reports that have been generated like Gartner and some of these other phishing reports to really demonstrate numbers around why this is important for organizations as a whole um, you know this this helps build the case so not only are you looking at your own organizational um, you know metrics but if you can look at industry specific metrics or or global metrics around you know cybersecurity threats this really does help build the business case um, so things to consider when you're putting this together and shameless plug we we do issue a security study every year and there's a lot of financial and costing metrics included in that as well. So again, shameless plug, but <laughs> we provide a lot of information for the industry as well, based on Canadian firms. So looking at return on investment considerations, if we look at cost benefit analysis, um, from an investment standpoint, external, the external security firm fees, that's the cost of the engagement. Um, the internal resources and time, that's something that you should look at as well, because if it's a more of a red team exercise, or potentially if it's a more collaborative experience or a purple team engagement, there is gonna be time for internal staff to coordinate, communicate, as well as the remediation efforts that should be considered in the investment side of things. On the benefits side, if you look at risk mitigation, by identifying and addressing vulnerabilities proactively, we can reduce the likelihood of cyber sorry, of successful cyber attacks. So quantify, a quantifiable ROI measure is calculating the potential financial loss, again, cost avoidance, we avoid by, by preventing breaches. So for instance, consider the average cost of a data breach, the legal fees and the reputational damage. But again, there's just taxonomies all over that we can find and leverage. There's a lot of other costs to consider. What I recommend, is at least having that in an internal database so you know that okay every time that i'm gonna build a business case or have an roi that's especially leveraging the cost avoidance model i know what costs are because now when i'm saying well this vulnerability can lead to this this and this you have already your costing metrics already there um another benefit being compliance so meeting regulatory requirements is essential for avoiding finance fines and the legal repercussions. So again, the, quanti the quantifiable, quantifiable ROI is comparing the cost of compliance, including penalties with the investment of security assessments. 
and very important brand protection. So safeguarding our reputation is invaluable. So quantifiable ROI is assessing the impact of a breach on customer trust, stock prices and market perception. Looking at the metrics for success. So vulner vulnerability density trends look at our improvements over time. So a quantifiable ROI would be assessed, sorry, would be calculating the reduction in vulnerabilities per system or application. The fewer vulnerabilities means the lower risk exposure. It doesn't mean the gravity of the risk is lower. It just means we now lower the, the multiple points and lower the risks overall. The, the open to remediated ratio measures the efficiency in addressing these vulnerabilities we identify. It's all well and good to conduct penetration tests, red team engagements, vulnerability assessments, etc. But if we're not addressing those vulnerabilities, we're not really do we're not doing our organizations any justice. So quantifiable ROI would be evaluating the cost savings achieved by promptly remediating vulnerabilities. And then the last one is incident response time. So are evaluating our readiness to detect and respond to attacks. A quantifiable ROI for this would be faster incident response, minimizing the impact of breaches. So overall, as a conclusion, investing in penetration testing and red team engagements is a strategic decision by proactively identifying and addressing, and addressing vulnerabilities. And we enhance our cybersecurity resilience and to protect our clients information, our sensitive data, and our overall organization's future. So that's what we bundled up in a business case. It It's a lot as I'm reading it or explaining it, but really it's a very short business case. It's three slides that you could present to senior management when looking to engage a firm overall to do penetration testing. So now, uh, you know, we, we talked about how we can use offensive security assessments to to measure the effectiveness and return of investment of our existing in investments. Um, but what we're going to talk about right now kind of just pairs with it. Something we wanted to touch on as part of this discussion, uh, some supplementary cybersecurity strategies that kind of go hand in hand with your existing program. And you can leverage offensive security assessments to validate that these programs are actually functioning the way they should be. Um, but we did want to touch on these because this is important. Um, and so one of the things we talked about earlier was cybersecurity awareness. And so um, ultimately, we, we, you know, a positive security culture enables employees to effectively detect, recognize, and respond to security threats. Um, and so an organizational culture that emphasizes security is, is crucial. Um, you know, employees at the end of the day are your last line of defense and um, you know they are essentially the human firewall so to speak and if that you know if that fails you hopefully have comp compensating controls with your technical controls that can help you know safeguard um, you know these attacks but ultimately fostering that culture is super important so training programs around cybersecurity awareness really should be designed to just not only educate but it should engage them and employees should not only understand the risks around the um, you know the the social engineering campaign the phishing campaign but they should be equipped to take the proactive steps in their daily activities and in their own lives personally to mitigate these risks you know um, it a lot of this education does also bleed into personal life um, under, making sure an individual is capable of understanding the risks of opening up even a personal email that you know could lead to them breaching their own account that could have organizational impacts as well you know, a lot of people reuse the same passwords in their personal life and in the work life. And, um, you know, there's a possibility that people have signed up for services uh, with organizational emails and they shouldn't have done that, but they did. And that could lead to a potential breach of, of passwords um, or, or credentials or, um, you know, if that other third party gets breached, for example. So understanding that uh, you need to give power to your people to be able to be proactive in, in mitigating these risks. And these training programs should be designed in ways that engage them. So gamification is one way you can do this. There's a lot of programs out there that help gamify, um, you know, security awareness um, and incentives is another way. Uh, I'm sure there's more, but ultimately getting people engaged um, and feel like they want to participate in these uh, activities really does foster that culture. 
And, and really, you should be regularly testing. Um, as we mentioned with penetration testing and social engineering, or sorry, red team assessments, if you're not regularly testing employees' uh, security responsiveness to real world scenarios, um, you're doing yourself a disservice. Um, ultimately, doing these regular tests develops that baseline to know where you're at. Um, it then you know, demonstrates the progression and improvements over time. We'll identify gaps. Maybe there's technological gaps that can be addressed. Um, maybe there's gaps in training. Maybe there's gaps in you know, specific individuals and how they understand things. So that'll allow you to address those. Um, and again, you shouldn't be penalizing people when they click on things, uh, especially in a simulation. It's an opportunity for education. Uh, penalizing doesn't doesn't normally work well. People take resentment to that, and you know that can lead to all sorts of problems. It's better to get them to be proactive and happy to address these things. Um, and then finally, yeah, it measures the program effectiveness, as I discussed. Um, you know, these real world scenarios do help uh, ultimately determine if the program is actually working. And there are a lot of platforms out there that um, you know run regular phishing simulations. Like you know, I'll, I'll name a few, like No Before, Boceron, FishMe. There's a whole bunch of them out there. Um, one thing that they all kind of suffer from, unfortunately, is they they do end up becoming very easy to detect over time. Especially if you've got someone who's somewhat tech savvy, they can figure out that this is actually a phishing simulation. So you need to engage in a additional assessment outside of your platform in order to really validate that these tools are actually working. Um, because over time, people will detect patterns. People will know that this is a phishing simulation. And it may not be a real world simulation, uh, the ones that are, are provided by these, these vendors, unfortunately. They're not going to be necessarily as sophisticated as some of the actual attacks that are happening. And so you can always look to progressively increase the sophistication and complexity of phishing campaigns when you have granular control. So you can start off maybe something less complex, less sophisticated, and if you see that your, your employees are responding well, they're not um, clicking on links, they're not entering credentials, they're not executing files, let's crank it up a notch. Let's bring it to a level where it's gonna be very sophisticated. Not gonna be a lot of indicators that this is actually a phishing campaign. It really should come down to, you know, hey, this doesn't seem right. Um, you know, maybe I can't, maybe the domain looks like it could be legitimate, um, but you know what they're asking here is kind of suspect. You know, these are the kind of things you want to eventually move to because the reality is when an organization gets compromised, sometimes it is incredibly difficult to determine that this was actually a phishing campaign. And it stems beyond phishing, email phishing. You should be also looking to test phishing or voice-based attacks in your organization. This is how a lot of organizations have been breached in the past. Um, you know, Twitter being a big one um, in the last couple of years. Um, I think even was MGM vishing, if I'm not mistaken, as well. I can't remember. There's a whole bunch of them that that have been out in the news recently. But vishing is very important. You know, having um, awareness around how to handle people calling on the phone, especially when that's pairing it with technology. So having someone on the phone ask you to log into a website that they're verbally telling you to log into. You know, that should be something that your employees raise as a flag, and they should be aware that this is something that. Um, uh, could be suspicious and they should be know they should know how to report that and same thing with physical uh, physical social engineering may not happen as much uh, as you might think but it does happen and employees should be aware on how to address that and deal with that proactively uh, so these are all things to take into consideration kind of extend a little bit beyond your typical cybersecurity awareness program but they all do help out uh, with ultimately safeguarding the organization and these assessments, like these one-time you know, penetration tests and red teams and social engineering simulations, uh, do help ultimately um, validate that the programs you have in place are working. <clears throat> I guess I'll continue with this one here, Ben, I guess, if you'd like. Uh, so privacy by design. Um, if we can start by adopting secure architecture and design right from the get-go. Um, <clears throat> it does ultimately provide us with um, significant benefits. And uh, it's fundamental really to start ensuring that <clears throat> um, our data privacy and integrity is intact. Apologies. Sore throat here. <clears throat> A um, data protection mechanisms really should be incorporated from the initial stages as I mentioned. Why? Um, this minimizes the vulnerabilities and gaps in the um, 
in the system uh, or application or whatever it is you're looking to secure. It's going to reduce the threat landscape um, of, of how an attacker would be able to navigate and potentially abuse or exploit um, some of these gaps and vulnerabilities. And it ultimately reduces the costs later on when you realize you have to go back and fix it anyways. Maybe you have to tear everything down and spend a whole bunch more money fixing um, infrastructure that really should have been secure from the get-go. Um, and so understanding that privacy by design uh, and security by design ultimately, uh, you know, right from the get-go is an important factor in, in, in really reducing costs overall, but being secure. Uh, preemptively tackling these risks, you know, companies can avoid uh, the potential devastating impacts of data breaches, you know, um, including financial losses, reputational damage, um, erosion of customer trust, uh, customer trust. Um, but there should also be a strategic focus on risk man management overall, not just through privacy by, by design, but risk management overall. You know, identifying and addressing risks associated with how data is stored, how data is processed, how it's transferred. It's um, all important. And it further enhances the organization's capability to protect its most valuable assets, which usually is data. And so penetration testing and red teams um, really challenge the existing security infrastructure, um, including privacy by design and the way the risk management process is implemented um, by identifying vulnerabilities, by identifying gaps that could be exploited by attackers, uh, and then I'll, you know, providing opportunity for us to address these before real threats do. By doing so, this you know, provides us with valuable insights, uh, <clears throat> enabling us to uh, fine tune our security measures, our security programs, ensuring that really the privacy and integrity of our data are robustly maintained. And finally, the last, I guess, supplementary cybersecurity um, consideration is, is threat intelligence and new technologies. So, in the changing world that we live in, staying vigilant in, in a modern cybersecurity world um, requires a bunch of different things. We obviously have to be paying attention to new technologies that are emerging. <clears throat> we have to look to adapt our security measures accordingly in order to address these, these changing um, tactics and techniques that attackers are looking to abuse, um, but ensuring we're also you know, up to date with patching our systems. Um, and finally, you know, engaging in broader cybersecurity community discussions um, to, to really get that support, to get that intelligence from other organizations that are, are going through the same thing. This is really going to help foster um, you know, a, a, a positive cybersecurity experience overall, and it'll help um, uh, improve your security program uh, greatly. So threat intelligence, you know, it involves gathering up and analyzing all sorts of data information on potential security threats uh, and vulnerabilities that are existing in you know organizations similar to your own your own organization and you know correlating that data to help organizations ultimately anticipate and proactively address potential attacks rather than just being reactive and and dealing with them as they they come and uh, another thing we need to be considering uh, is new technologies so an example would be ai everyone's starting to delve into AI. And if you're not, you're falling behind. You should be doing so. Um, but it can be playing a critical role in improving uh, security overall for the organization, your, your posture, um, <clears throat> as well as improving efficiencies in the way things are done. Uh, assessing and, and integrating these cutting edge security technologies, such as leveraging AI, you know, organizations can ultimately ensure that their defenses are going to be just as advanced as these threat actors are. Um, because threat actors are using AI to get into the environment. So if they're using AI and you're not using AI, then you're going to be victim to a, a breach very soon. And so penetration testing and red team assessments, you know, it, it can simulate a sophisticated cyber attack. Le AI can be leveraged and to validate the effectiveness of these adaptive strategies. Um, so we can ensure that ultimately organizations are not just prepared to deal with these, these new threats, but that they can be steps ahead. Um, and really, it, it is important to start looking at using these assessments to help ensure that you are uh, staying ahead of the game. And I'll, I'll jump in with a quick example because I know Chris doesn't like to burn his techniques, and I like I like to I like to brag about what the team does. But we leverage we leverage AI for deep fakes, etc. Just different things that we can do that attackers are using or threat actors are using. So you want to ensure that you are considering 
what threat actors are using or doing, that you're able to do it in catch your team first, just in case to mitigate and reduce risk. I didn't burn. I didn't burn any of our techniques, Chris. I know. I was. I was worried there for a second. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I guess to sum everything up, Ben, I'm going to let you maybe sum things up because my voice is falling apart here. Not a problem. I got you. So in in conclusion, as we summarize things up, cybersecurity is not just about a cost savings initiative to mitigate mitigate against breaches. It also promotes brand reputation, customer confidence, and ensures regulatory compliance, and a lot more than that as well. You get a lot of efficiencies by having a robust security program in place. So offensive security assessments, they can provide meaningful insights and metrics to validate and justify your cybersecurity investments. We just spent X amount of dollars on cyber awareness training, new NGFWs, new WAFs, et cetera. Conducting an offensive security engagement could validate, have you implemented the right controls with those technologies? Were they configured properly? Was your staff educated in a way that they're able to respond to potential threats? So it's really about justification of your cybersecurity investments, as well as communicating the ROI to stakeholders. It should align to business objectives and should be quantifiable, realistic, and demonstrate value. Last but not least is leveraging strategies such as security awareness programs, privacy by design, threat intelligence, leveraging new technologies to complement existing services and initiatives and validate the effectiveness of these strategies with offensive security testing. Yeah, and ultimately this, this holistic approach is really what's needed. It's not one tool fixes all. You really need to be looking at things from a layered approach, defense in depth, as they say, um, because that's not only going to safeguard against the immediate threats, but it's going to solidify your organization's ability to withstand an ever-changing digital world that we live in um, and help provide resilience and trust and competitive advantage um, for your organization. So a little bit about the team that we manage without getting into the full shameless plug. One of the things that we pride ourselves in is we contribute to the security industry. We've we've submitted CVEs, so common vulnerability exposure, I believe. So we've submitted our own vulnerabilities we've identified to the overall community. We provide research, innovation, talks, and this is what you're looking for for an organization that's doing these type of assessments, not an organization that's going to just grab the latest tool, point, click, scan your environment and say, well, here's a list of vulnerabilities because our pen test tool said it. You want a company or organization that's very client centric with their approach is able to do manual penetration testing. AI provides a lot in terms of efficiency. You still add on the manual approach and creativity because we do have that edge, at least for now, from a human perspective, that we're able to identify a lot of vulnerabilities that AI won't catch today. Maybe it will tomorrow, but today we still have a little bit of advantage before it fully takes over. And you're making sure that they have the experience and expertise that they bring to the table for assisting organizations with these type of engagements. So if, again, shameless plug for the team, fully certified overall in the overall spectrum of offensive security, red team testing, social engineering, whether it's operating system or network certifications as well, as well as overall risk. So the broader team is a risk, is a risk team. So as we are able to identify vulnerabilities, going back to Chris mentioned as well, looking at what those vulnerabilities, what the impact of, of those vulnerabilities being exploited, and that's where we see things from our risk perspective as well. Last but not least, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide, it's really how we address the, the concerns of our clients. As we as we build out our solutions and we and we actually operate our solutions with clients, we're ensuring that we are looking at three core things to assist our clients, protecting their critical assets, to relieving their increasing regulatory pressure, and keeping on top of an evolving threat landscape and what we can do to assist our clients with that as well. And on that note, we'd like to say thank you for your time today. 
and I noticed that we do have a couple we of questions. We do have some here questions too. here. Yeah, I'll take I'll take the first one here since we got about five more minutes. <clears throat> so okay. some key factors to consider uh, when looking for a pen testing company. That's a great question. So uh, you're going to want to obviously see uh, that the penetration testing company can provide you with sample reporting. That's going to be one of the first things you want to look for because you want to see what kind of results you're ultimately getting at the end of this. Um, this will allow you to determine whether or not it's just the output of a tool, for example, or if the individual is actually spending time going through and manually uh, testing the environment because there's a lot of firms out there that really do say they do penetration testing or red team and the reality is it's just a vulnerability assessment. It's just a scan from a tool and that's all it is. So one thing I would suggest is making sure that you um, you ask for a sample report, ask for references, especially industry specific references if possible. Um, you know this will give you the confidence that someone in the same industry or you know someone with reputable um, um, credentials you know, validates that the organization you're doing work with has has the stuff needed in order to do this successfully. Um, so these are these are some factors you definitely want to consider. Um, you want to make one. sure that. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll add one definitely. Um, in the industry, we know that you shouldn't use the same company indefinitely. You should always bring in an additional company at some point for a difference in perspective. If you if you're looking at a company and they can't recommend at least another company, then that might not be the company for you. We've yeah. we've partnered with other organizations. When we get busy, we we tend to to find individuals who could help us. You want to make sure that you have an organization that's not afraid to say go to another organization, validate validates what we may have missed, but validate what we may have missed, and then come back to us because. We know you're going to come back to us. Yeah, that's a good point, Ben. Um, the next question in the queue is, how are ROI calculations typically communicated? Using worst case scenario, it's always a concern to paint doom and gloom, but without communicating ROI compared against worst case scenario is a little bit difficult. For example, by mitigating the risk up with the cost of X, we will avoid an incident that would cost why, and then you could insert whatever the the ransomware scenario was there. I'll let you answer that, and I'll jump in with my thoughts, Chris. Yeah, so I mean that that obviously does have to be communicated, right? That is one of the main reasons, of course, why we have cybersecurity to begin with. Is we do need to demonstrate the value ultimately of what it would cost uh, if a breach was to happen. But as we mentioned, I know this was asked maybe 29 minutes ago, so we probably we may have touched on it. There are other ways you can start looking at. Um, mentioning how um, cybersecurity is just more than a cost preventative um, you know, uh, initiative from a breach perspective. You know, is it going to potentially improve the brand recognition? Is it going to allow you to acquire new clients? You know, what kind of business could you potentially be attracting now that you are someone who's actively doing offensive security assessments or really putting an emphasis on security in your uh, environment? These are all positive um, factors that could bring in money, which you know normally is not associated with cybersecurity purchases. Um, so these are things you can start looking to to add in uh, to how you communicate things. Um, and ultimately, over time, you can also put metrics in to show that the improvements that you have taken along the way uh, have seen success. And I think that will also help, you know, paint a better picture because instead of painting the doom and gloom around, oh, we're not doing so well over time, hey, we're doing better. We're doing great. We're actually, you know, um, a secure organization because we're our statistics have uh, shown shown improvement over time. So things to consider as you do this uh, over and over again. But Ben, you can maybe have some uh, so, suggestions on that. So one of the cheat codes that I found over the years is piggybacking on the business impact assessments engagements that your organization is conducting, whether externally or internally, that's looking at the impact from a quantifiable measure, whether it's time or whether it's costs. So by looking at some of those potential breach costs that, that I, I mentioned, adding that to a business impact assessment, because they're asking the same type of questions, you're able to really clean up a lot of the, the data for a worst case scenario. And again, when we're conducting these engagements, we're looking at if we're able to breach or compromise, let's say your active directory in your organization, or even a physical breach in your organization, and then again, taking over your service, et cetera, 
what is the worst case cost of something like that happening if it is a threat actor doing it? And you're building out scenarios and you're building out the cost for these scenarios as well. And then okay. I see the, the last. Uh, yeah, yeah one, one more from, from Reza here. So we have, um, <clears throat> when there is a breach, will the pen testing company take the lead on the security aspect of dealing with insurance companies and the hackers themselves? So there, there definitely are some companies out there that do that liaison between the ransomware brokers, um, and and they will look to hopefully reduce the the cost of the the um, ransom. Um, so it really depends on the organization. Um, in for the, at the very least, a proper security firm will be able to point you in the right direction to deal with those individuals. Um, so it may not be the organization directly. But we, you know, as an example, we would be able to provide you with um, individuals who we trust that would be able to help do that communication for you with the the insurance companies or uh, with the the ransomware brokers, for example. So it may not be something that the organization does directly, but we'd be able to get that for you and help you along the way. Or shameless plug, the broader CDW security team, we do offer a breach retainer. That yes. would that would be able to assist you throughout those type of breaches or incidents. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, uh, we are right at the hour here. Three oh one. Some great questions. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, I hope this was a valuable insight into how to approach uh, return of investment on on these types of offensive security assessments, and you've you've gained some knowledge and some some pointers on how you can look to uh, get that you know budget that you need. Um, and you know, feel free to reach out to either Ben or I uh, at any time. You can go to the the the, the link there. Um, you can reach out to us on LinkedIn if you'd like as well. Um, more than happy to start some conversations if uh, you know and just even bounce ideas. This is what we like to do and uh, we like working with security professionals uh, no matter the industry and, and what you guys do. So thank you for coming. I uh, really appreciate it. Thank you everyone.